Wonderful. Hi, everyone. It's Obi Abuchi here with the Leading From Your Core podcast and vodcast. This show is dedicated to helping leaders all around the world discover leadership wisdom, stories, and insights that will enable you to tap into the power of leading from the inside out. And I'm delighted to have a wonderful friend as a guest on the show, Yetunde Hoffman. Uh, Yetunde is the founder of Solaris, an executive leadership development program targeted at the Black executive and professional women in organizations. She's an internationally accredited board level executive leadership coach and managing director of Synchrony Development Consulting. Uh, also someone close to my heart, she published her first book, Beyond Engagement, so I've got a copy uh, here, uh, Beyond Engagement, The Value of Love-Based Leadership in Organizations, and I'm looking forward to diving into that a bit more uh, uh, finally, and that book is available in all leading bookstores, and we'll put the details in the show notes as well, and Yetunde is also the founder of the Enjoyable Life series a community nonprofit organization designed to have men and women at all levels in business and education and community identify practical ways in which they can live more enjoyably in all that they do. And I've had the privilege of experiencing a number of events linked to the Enjoyable Life series, including What's Your Story, speaking at it, attending it, enjoying uh, being moved and inspired by it. So Yetunde, to, to say it's exciting to have you on the show is an understatement, but I'll still say it anyway. It is exciting to have you on the show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Obi. I am excited to be on your show. I feel honored that you have invited me. It really is a privilege. I'm looking forward to our conversation. <laughs> so am I, so am I. And our listeners and viewers always keen to know more about our guests. I've, I've introduced you, but what else would you like to say about yourself just so they get to know you a little bit more and then we'll dive into your book and explore leadership and maybe even put the world to right in the next 30, 35 minutes. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Obi. I mean, what I'd really love to, to help your listeners and, and viewers understand about me is is I just love nothing more than helping people and organization get the very best out of all of who they are and I think this is probably why we connect so much because I think you have you have a similar ethos and it's it's become so powerful to me and my tenets are love leadership and results and I try to live by those tenets and encourage others to do the same as much as possible because love is that unconditional acceptance of all of who I am and what's and all and creating an environment where you can also accept yourself for all of who you are because when we start in that place we can operate at our very best and then when you combine that with leadership with love at its roots being authentic being able to lead from the inside out, building trust, commitment, responsibility, a life of contribution. The results, that's the results bit that we can create for each other and for the world can be awesome. So this is the only additional thing I want to <laughs> understand about me. Wow. <laughs> at night. All right. I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend. I, I feel emotional already. I feel moved already. Uh, I've uh, we've connected in, in recent years when you were writing your book. I, I was writing mine. The your passion and just coming back to this idea of love, leadership, and results. A lot of leaders they there's a lot of talk about leadership, right? And so that's no surprise. And and also results. Oh, absolutely, they'll connect with that. But when you bring love into the equation, they automatically, and we're going to go there for sure, obviously, with what you've written in your book, but automatically, some people might think, oh, wait a second. No, no, I thought this was a podcast for professionals, for, for leaders. We're talking about business. Where does love come into it? And yet, when you describe this idea of just that unconditional acceptance, that 
recognition that that I'm human and I've got strengths, but I've also got struggles. I've got challenges. And th the reason I, I felt emotional is because I think I can, that absolutely helps people give their best when you know, hey, I'm not going to be blamed. I'm not going to be put down. I'm not going to be shunned. I can unleash and, and express all of who I am to make a difference wherever I am. Who doesn't want that? And, and so, so yeah, it really connects with me. And I think it's uh, powerful in the world that that uh, we're in today. So thank you for sharing that and adding oh, that. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's, uh, and we'll, we'll dive into some of this some more. What, what I'd love to, let, before I go into your book, uh, I'd love to just hear from you. What is it you enjoy most about being a leader? You have led in organizations, you are running your own business now, you speak to leaders. What is it you enjoy most about being a leader? Oh, do you know what? First of all, the, the fact that leadership is relational. So the, the, the opportunity to get to know people beyond what they do or have and to, and to experience the depth that they have within them. I think for me, that's, it's just, it's, I cannot, words cannot describe <laughs> for me what I feel when, when I get to know people, that leader as a human being. And in that process, they're also having to get to know me as human because leadership is relational. The other thing that I love because of the work I do, you know what I say? Getting people and enjoying seeing people get the very best out of who they are. Mm. In my work and in the way that I lead and even in the jobs that I've done, when I've worked with people that I've been able to play a part albeit small in their growth and I hear from them an experience of where they were and where they are now because of some of the journey we've been through together mm -hmm. and that really does excite me and then I see them go on to do more and I just would sit there in the background and and I think yes I knew that person, I knew that team had talent, I knew that person had great potential, and now I can see it, and I know that there's much more to come. That's what I get out of it, that's what I love, that's what brings me joy, really, it does. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine already, I mean, I, I'm feeling the energy from you right now, I, I hope all of the listeners and viewers uh, I couldn't help but think, as you were sharing there, I've run several leadership programs where we'll ask the participants, tell us about a time that you had a leader who really made a difference, who really believed in you. And what they describe is who you are, right? This leader who believed in me, believed in my potential, gave me opportunities saw that they, they they desired to know me. It wasn't they were on my case and delivering results, but they really desired to know me and help me grow, right? And, and that just, you can sense that focus on your own commitment to service rather being, than being driven by ego, which as a leader is all about me and how can I use the people around me to get results for myself rather than how can I help these people to become more than they ever thought they could be? And, and those are the leaders that we absolutely remember and our world needs more of. Absolutely, because we have so much to bring to the world, Obi, I really do. And, and it's based on a fundamental belief of mine that we all are leaders, whether mm -hmm. you're in a nation or sleeping on the streets, we all have leadership in us. And the challenge we have in organizations is, is, is dismantling the, the, the barrier that the organizational structure and diagram puts in place. So that when you are a leader here, talking to somebody there, you think, oh gosh, I have to be different. But actually then you don't have to be. We all are human. We all relate. We all have something to offer. And mm -hmm. we all, all, all deserve to belong and operate at our very best. This is, this is how I see it. And so I think if, if organizations 
and leaders and organizations can encourage themselves and those that work around them mm. to behave in ways that says, okay, we're all in this together mm -hmm. and we're not going to allow the structure of the business to be a barrier or to be uh, an influencing factor. Mm -hmm. It's there in the way that we relate. It's amazing how much many, how much more breakthroughs we would have and experience in the world of work. Yeah, that that's so true. And I, I w one of the ways I was I was chatting with somebody about it recently, and I used a sporting analogy as a way of helping people connect with this. And and, and it's not that I'm a massive football fan, although my boys are, so I have no choice but to be. But anyway. If you think of a football team and everyone's playing their position, you want them to play as best as they can. Absolutely. You, you, you don't want, oh, just the captain to fly because, oh, he's the captain or the manager to do. You, you want everyone to play their position as best as they can, unleash their potential, work together and make sure that we deliver for, for the team. Same thing within an organization that regardless of the hierarchy, whatever level people are at, we absolutely want them to be at their best so that they're passing, they're connecting, they are essentially helping us deliver the outcomes that we want as an organization. And sometimes leaders don't realize that the barriers that they're putting in place that are stopping people from passing well, defending well, scoring well, and so I love that that focus on the relational aspect and, and being able to, when you see yourself as a leader, you take ownership for being the absolute best you can in your position and delivering what you need to for the wider team. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that when, you, when you're coming from that place, which is one of the reasons why I love your book, Leading from the Core, is it, it's, the, it's the importance of knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. Knowing yourself. And, and to any leaders listening out there, it's so important because if, if you're a leader and you are leading people in the sense of you've got people, direct reports and so on, mm -hmm. leading an enterprise, that's, you, you shouldn't take your responsibility lightly. Those are human beings. And mm -hmm. in order to do that effectively, it's important to know who you are. Mm. And to start from the inside out. Mm. That's a great place to start. Mm. And by understanding who you are, you can make the best of who you are and then encourage others to understand who they are so they can make the best of who they are and lead from that place in mm. alignment with that place. Mm. Mm. Thank you. I, I'd love, I, I want to explore that a bit more, especially in the context of love, because when you talked about love earlier on, that unconditional acceptance of others, I'm curious to the degree, the, what's your experience of leaders not really having unconditional acceptance and love for themselves? Is that part of what gets in the way? What, what's your experience from the leaders that you've worked with. <laughs> Do you know what, Obi, you're absolutely right, because I think sometimes some leaders don't appreciate the value of, first of all, understanding themselves, what's and all, and accepting themselves, because you can change only when you choose to change, but then there are times you don't need to, and you only need to change when the results you're creating for yourself that you want for yourself, you're just not achieving, then you need to hold the mirror up. That unconditional acceptance is an appreciation of who you are as human. Mm -hmm. And I find that there's quite a few leaders who are not there yet. And there are some who are. And mm -hmm. I experience the difference. When you're in a place of self-acceptance, it's easier for you to create an environment where others can belong where others can speak up, where others can accept themselves because the, root, the, the fruit of self-acceptance is a willingness to speak up, is a willingness to bring all of who you are mm. to the workplace, it's a willingness to take correction, the ability to appreciate that when somebody says something to you, 
it's potentially coming from a good place. It makes it easier for you to forgive. It makes it easier for you to encourage. So it really is a route that leaders should ascribe to and should, should aspire to be in that place, that place of, I accept myself once and all for all of who I am, because it's imperative to me creating an environment where we can all be in a place that we can accept ourselves for all of who we are. Wow, wow. Be before we go too deep into this, because I really want to explore this some more, I want to step back a little bit and say, where did this all start for you? So every book has a why behind it, but there's a story. What, what love-based leadership, was it a eureka moment, one of those thought in the shower, experiences, challenges, where did this start for you? And why <laughs> did you, <laughs> why did you write this? <laughs> you know what, sometimes I wish it was one of those eureka moments. <laughs> I've seen the light, you know. <laughs> But you know, I, it's, it was a slow process. You know, I've, my background is human resources and I've had over 35 years working as an HR leader across FTSE 100 businesses, global organizations, worked regionally, driven a lot of change, been on the receiving end of change. And I began to appreciate there has to be another way. I've seen betrayals, I've seen people operate in situations in a way that isn't true to who they are, but the environment has led them to be that. I've experienced leaders who've been hurt in different ways and found it difficult to recover. Um, I've, of course, I've designed and delivered a lot of engagement service. I've seen others do it and and still it's not worked. I've seen initiatives on well-being and mental um, health and um, physical health and, and, and initiatives such as um, speak up cultures and here's a, a, a confidential line and whistleblowing, name it Obi. I've seen it in organizations and I've done my fair share. Mm. But always the statistics tell you something different. The level of engagement across organizations at home and abroad are inconsistent. Mental health challenges are still on the increase. There mm -hmm. continues to be a drive for productivity. And yet, as human beings, we're going to live longer and more of our lifetime will be spent working in organizations and working with people. And when the penny dropped for me, I was thinking, well, the very thing that marks us as human, that aspect to give and receive love, which is the greatest gift and the greatest need. We all want to belong. We want to be accepted. That's very rarely looked at. We have a little bit of it scratched at the surface. We talk about kindness and compassion and um, smile at each other and, and, and let's be generous and so on. All mm. of these are fruits of love. You cannot really be kind if you're not coming from a place of love. You cannot be compassionate consistently if you're not coming from a place of love. And therefore I thought, well, let's get to the root of it. If mm. more of us were exploring the root of what it takes for us to be human, mm. then there, has, there is a chance, there's a possibility that the very thing that we're chasing to make happen so that we can have productivity, there could be inclusion, there can be results, there can be success. Those very things we might get if we chose to pay attention to the most difficult yet the most needed, which is love. So I thought, let's go for it. And it's become a, a passion of mine. I believe this is what will change the world. I think mm. this is what will change organizations for the better mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, regardless of where we are in the world. Wow. Wow. That, so the, the root of, of it, you said it was a bit of a slow journey. We, you're doing a lot of things, a lot of initiatives, leading them and, and realizing that 
ultimately this isn't working. There's still the toxicity. There's still the ego driven leadership. There's the, the fallout of that in terms of our mental health um, and personal resilience. And, and therefore let's go to ultimately you said leadership, it's all relational. If we're relating to each other, how can we connect with something that is so important to us as human beings, which is connecting to each other in a way where we feel that belonging and yeah. that acceptance, that unconditional acceptance. Yeah. So move away. And people say this all the time, but I feel you're getting to the heart of it. People say, oh, we shouldn't be human doings. We're human beings. <laughs> and they think, but what does that mean? Yeah. What's the root of that? And breaking it down to, can we create an environment where we feel we belong. And everything that you mentioned earlier on, that means I can speak up. That means I feel the psychological safety to say, yeah. here's what I'm thinking. This yeah. is what I feel. This is what I think could help us as, as a team, as an organization. And then do I feel accepted? Yeah. Not just when I've delivered and, and outperformed my KPIs, but when I've dropped the ball or some things and, and people will take that interest and say, hey, Obi, what, what's going on here? What, what's happening? And feeling that acceptance. So that's... Absolutely. And it means the, the language of human would come back into the world of work. You know, there's so many things, KPIs, BAUs, and all these acronyms that, that are peppered across the world of work. And yet people are just desperate, including me, to relate mm -hmm. to people. Mm -hmm. And... What it would mean is that when you have meetings, when you have guests, when you have uh, uh, clients and so on come, you, you relate more from a place of, of who you are being, not what mm. you do and your job titles. A lot of companies now, oh, they go into their meetings and they have their, their, their job titles, not even written on their foreheads, but that's they're coming in as the CEO, as a CHRO, as a CFO. But actually, why can mm. tell is human beings who are doing a job for mm. the organizations, for the stakeholders near and far, so that the world can be a better place, who have a purpose to deliver a product, make a service effective, mm. so that the world can be a better place. Now that that is so amazing. I, I get. I mean, th there'll be some believers that are listening to this. That they're like, I believe in this absolutely. Obi Yetunde, I'm sold. There'll be the the cynics as well. <laughs> Yes, but but it, it, either way, whether it's the, the those that are for this, those, those that are cynical, what are some of the barriers to making this a a reality? What, what are some of the barriers you see? Absolutely, and and I would say this, whether it's for the cynics or for the or those who buy in it, I, I think both both are right. It's good to be cynical, and I would say pay attention, start the dialogue. So that's the first barrier sometimes a reluctance of people to even talk about the word love in organization mm. and i think that it only starts with one it takes one person a building in the mind of an architect starts with a thought so it just starts with the thought and the dialogue with somebody that you trust in your organization and then the dialogue can expand into what would this environment look like? What would the difference be in the way that we conducted our meetings, in the way that we conducted our performance reviews, in the way that we related to each other, in the decisions that we made, in the way we allocated resources, in the way we hired talent, in the way we drove our inclusion strategy, and, and, and. Just by that, it starts with a dialogue. And then to say, well, like any change management program, you say, well, how do we start this? You start with, you know, I saw a company the other day that have their values around kindness and compassion, which are all fruit of love. So you might say, well, maybe we don't want to use love as a word, oh. but start with the fruits of it, knowing mm -hmm. where they're at, which is beautiful. And then you have organizations that are brave, like Ferminage, Headbox, that talk about love in organization, like Croda. So you have these businesses that are willing to talk about it. Mm. As well, and that's the beginning. So that's the first barrier, reluctance to discuss it. And that's because of the, the world has taken the word love and brought a lot of connotations. You have the Me Too, sure. 
love is like mm, and on uh, and on savory thing in the world of work it could lead to sexual harassment and stuff like that but actually the kind of love i'm talking about is is a tough love it's about that acceptance of who we are as human beings that's mm. what love is about it's not those things the second barrier or the actually is time time a lot of executives in the world of work don't have the time to invest to coach their people effectively to have the quality time to get to know each other to have the things that says let's take the team away and spend time getting to know each other so time is a big barrier and i think that if people would if leaders would legislate some time to even get to work together as a team to coach to develop each other that could also be another another way to get over this obstacle of bringing love into the organization so you've got time and the third thing is about self-awareness i think a lot of leaders and people in the world of work don't understand who they are mm. and so the the um when you when you have a lack of understanding of who you are what makes you tick what makes you happy what makes you sad what you love what you hate etc if you don't know that well it's difficult to 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 encourage others to mm. be in that place too so set a lack of self-awareness uh time poor and mm -hmm. reluctance to explore the notion of love and the fourth one actually is the, the short-termist the desire to drive short-term results which sure. comes, yeah. you know i sit on boards as well so that desire that pressure from the external stakeholder and investor and from ourselves short-term targets we've got to show the evidence the return on investment quickly drives a focus towards the money and the bottom line mm. as opposed to the focus on the person whom you need to have engaged whom you need to to have them really bring their very best Mm -hmm. So that when you focus on them, the very thing, the bottom line, the short-term results that you're trying to generate will come easier. Sure. So the, the priorities, the focus in the world of work is different. Even though many organizations say, oh, you know, we put our people first and people, our people make the difference. Well, your actions don't really demonstrate that. If their actions demonstrated that, then love will come easier. So that's the fourth barrier. And they could mm. be more. Sure, yeah. But I, I love the fact that you've, in, in describing the barriers, also just given some practical tips for people to apply. So that reluctance to start the dialogue, talking about it, but also understanding what it means, right? So part of the dialogue is, okay, what do we mean by love in our organization what does that look like what's this what's the language that people can connect to and relate to that delivers some benefits for us and and reframing the the some of the negative connotations around to positive connotations that help us to create this environment that really uh, unleashes more of our people's creativity and motivation and passion and that time is is a is a challenge. And yet, when if leaders realize that when you know your people, you're really able to grow them. How can you grow someone if you don't know them? I heard a story yesterday of um, uh, one of uh, an associate uh, colleague of mine was working with a leadership team. Uh, there are about hundred people in this organization, and they didn't know that someone in their team had recently lost their their mum. Like they they didn't know, and and they were devastated when they found out. And he came in, and just by being curious and asking questions and being interested in knowing them, rather than just focusing on all of the activity, he found this out. That shouldn't happen in organizations. It, it people ought to know quickly because we're making time as leaders for those important conversations. And then, of course, not just thinking about the the short term hey what what is this quarter's results going to be 
and and yes okay to a degree that that's important but you want to be in it for the long game um i that you'll know this this african proverb if you want to go far go alone if you want to if you want to go fast go alone but if you want to go far go together exactly. as an organization do we want to go far or do we just want to be around in the short term if you want to be around in the short term then just focus on short-term results but if you want to go far as an organization build the sort of culture that can withstand a lot of the tension and challenges we've had over the last couple of years and absolutely this is what that's a resilient about. organization one that can withstand that's a joyful organization actually mm. one that can withstand the storms and the the ups and downs of life because they're going together they're going to go further together and they'll be standing in the midst of the uncertainty and the challenges and the storms that are thrown at them, like we're mm. facing today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what about, so some people will hear about the barriers, but you've given some great tips to overcome those. You, you mentioned some of the organizations that are embracing this. And in your book, you, you talk about that too. What are some of the core benefits that people can expect other than just the intuitive yes this will be more psychological safety and and we'll intuitively we sense that we'd be able to achieve more but what other benefits are you already seeing in some of the organizations you're working with or some that you know of that are implementing this you know when I look at the organizations that I know of that are coming from that place you just need to look at their results so if you look at Feminic, which is the global fragrance and flavors organization, the way they've withstood the storms and challenges of life, the change, I mean, they are a family owned business, but they operate like a commercial limited um, PLC. They've got a board, they've got a chairman, they've got all the, and so the, 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 the focus and, and attend, attention to discipline and the safety of their people is almost second to none wow. and that's because they care that's because they come from a place of love that's mm. and then if you look a bit closer to home there's another organization i know called headbox where they are a, an online events booking business and yet in spite of the storms they've been through with covid who was booking events who was going to 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 all kinds of places but the love that they are bringing in, give them the, the wherewithal and the willpower to be agile, to be innovative in the solutions they offered, not just to their clients, but in ways they could stay together. The, the forgiveness that came out when they had to do some restructure and then come out of it mm -hmm. at the other end. And they've got love, show love at the heart of their values framework. So for me, that's another example. And so I think that when, you, when, when organizations start to come from this place, the benefits actually are results on the bottom line, mm. consistent growth, a reduction in absence, sickness, people speaking up, the engagement respect, mm -hmm. those statistics, those KPIs that we're looking for yeah. will, will, will be consistently high you'll have something that you can then connect that to your productivity, then to your bottom line. Your, the speed of innovation, your talent pipeline and your innovation pipeline will be healthier. And, you know, one of the things that I really, really appreciate is that you will find that the people who are in the earlier stages of their career will be more attracted to you as a mm. And I had firsthand experience of this. A few years ago, I did a talk on why not have love in business. It was a TEDx talk at the IE Business School in Madrid at the Google campus there. And Obi, I tell you something, people my age, my generation, older, maybe a little bit younger, were like, well, nice talking today, but I'm not sure if this is going to be for me. But the audience who came around to talking more, um, considerably about it to to wrestle with how they can bring this into their organizations into the way they want to be leaders where the younger generation people much earlier in this day mm. in the career and so that gave me hope and wow. i yeah. this if if you want to attract 
um, people to your business, if you want to be able to live your purpose, because you cannot say you're, you are a purpose-driven organization if you couldn't have love at, it, at the root of your intention. So if you say you're a purpose-driven purpose organization and your purpose is clear and you want to attract people, it's important to be ready to come from a place of love because long-term you'll have your resources, you'll be able to move them. There'll be this, your decisions will be made faster. If organizations measured the length of time from when a decision is made to having it been executed mm. over a period of time, we're in between the activities around bringing in a love-based leadership were implemented, it would come, the time lost will be shortened, which will then release the time to do more meaningful things, more value-adding things that would ultimately impact that bottom line. Wow. Uh, 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 an overwhelming number of benefits uh, there from the bottom line to speed of decision making to ease of connection within organizations it it sounds like an absolute no brainer, no -brainer right <laughs> no brainer and, and i don't know for some reason i i seem to think it was my angelo but maybe it was someone else but i i couldn't help but think of that quote people don't care how not much you know until they know how much you care right and and yes. the young generation are feeling that more and more and and they're being drawn to purpose-driven organizations who not only have love for themselves love for one another but love for the environment love for for neighbors love for the community it's so yes you're skilled and you're capable and and you've got these stripes but do you really care do you do really you care, about really me? care do you know what you know? it seems a no-brainer but you know what it is? I think there's a lot of leaders in the world of work and we still are in that world, that place today that believe that leadership is about having all the answers. It's about knowing. So to, to come from a place of love requires a level of vulnerability. And even mm. though people like Brené Brown talk about their strength in vulnerability, mm -hmm. you know, organizations are not, they're not led by people in the main who are ready to go there. They need to be mm. encouraged to go there with love, mm. to become vulnerable and to actually discover how strong they can be and are in mm. their vulnerability. That for me is the reason why it seems a no-brainer. And it's one, it's another barrier. So that's the fifth barrier. A reluctance to be vulnerable. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is why organizations don't want to go there. And yet the younger generation in the main seem a little bit more open. And when I say younger, I don't necessarily mean in terms of age. I mean, in terms of in the earlier stages of their career, those that yeah. really feel they've got less to lose, you know? Sure. Go for yeah. it, let's try it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I feel we could go on and on, but this is a compelling topic. I encourage everyone to read Yetunde's book, Beyond Engagement, The Value of Love-Based Leadership in Organizations. I speak to HR leaders, business leaders all the time that are talking about how do we keep our people engaged? Uh, the, where By the time this is out, the bonuses will probably be given for most people at the end of the financial year. Organizations are saying, are we going to keep our people? Are they going to go somewhere else? How do we tackle sickness? How do we tackle engagement? The answer isn't out there. The answer isn't some new innovative product. The answer is deep within all of us, and it's actually free creating this environment of belonging and acceptance and Yetunde you've got clearly uh, have offered an incredible gift to the world so may more leaders take this on just okay. in closing final piece of advice for listeners and viewers who are, are grappling with this excited and want to implement it what one or two things would you say here's where to start thank you Take the first step. That's the one thing. Take the first step. In organization, there'll be that person at work whom you trust. If you're having a challenge, you might have as a sounding board. That's the person to go to and say, listen, I'm, I'm wondering whether there could be another way for us to drive success in this business. Mm -hmm. in this team. 
And why don't we explore the notion of love? What's the best way? You might not even want to start with using the love word, but where would we start? Do we, let's, let's really start to examine what the difference would be. That's the first thing to do, start the dialogue. Mm. Start the dialogue, have a conversation with just one, and then go to the next step and go to the next step. And before you know it, it becomes easier. And the reason why it will become easier, when I was interviewing for my book, some of the leaders in the beginning, oh, I don't want to talk about love-based leadership. By the time we got to the end, they were talking about it. It will be the same in organization. It just takes one person of courage to start the dialogue. Brilliant. And then before we know it, it's normalized and it becomes a, a way of doing things. And our world, our organizations, communities, much, much better place. <laughs> Exciting. Well, yeah, today that's been wonderful. I'm looking forward to having a part two of our conversation. Thank you. It'll be much needed. Thank you. To all our viewers and listeners, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you take that on board. Uh, I highly recommend reading the book. I know, I know there isn't one person mm -hmm. listening that doesn't want to be in an org environment in an organization where there's high levels of belonging and acceptance that's the sort of environment that unleashes more of uh, the best of ourselves so uh, take this on board and remember that if you want to be a courageous and resilient leader if you want to live life on purpose and with purpose then it starts from the inside out have a great day and see you on the next show. And Yetunde, thanks again for joining. Thank you. I like to talk to you. Thank you. All the very best. Bye for now. Bye bye.